So we've already seen the mechanism for an E2 elimination reaction. And in this video, we'll focus in on bases and how to control the regioselectivity. So just to remind you, right, our alpha carbon is the one connected to our halogen, and our beta carbon is the one over here. And the double bond is going to form between our alpha and our beta carbons. Note that for an E2 elimination, there is no carbocation in the mechanism, so you don't have to worry about any carbocation rearrangements here. Let's take a look at the, uh, some of the possible bases that you could use for this reaction. So bases. Usually you would use a base like an alk oxide for these reactions. So an alk oxide is the conjugate base to an alcohol. So let's take a look at one possible base. Let's go ahead and look at sodium ethoxide. So sodium ethoxide is a sodium cation. And then the ethoxide anion is oxygen bonded to CH2CH3. And then the oxygen is going to have three lone pairs of electrons around it, which gives it a negative one formal charge. So this is sodium ethoxide. So let me go ahead and write sodium ethoxide over here. And it can be abbreviated N-A-O-E-T. So that's usually how you would see it written in a mechanism. And you can see that the ethoxide anion is the conjugate base to ethanol. right? If I look at the ethoxide anion right here, and if I added a proton onto that base, I would get ethanol. So this base is very similar to the famous sodium hydroxide in, in Gen Chem, right? So sodium hydroxide Na plus OH minus, right? It looks almost exactly the same. The only difference is this ethyl group down here for sodium ethoxide. So sodium ethoxide is more of an organic base than sodium hydroxide. Let's take a look at another possible base for an E2 elimination reaction. Let's look at, let's look at this. Let's look at this molecule. So we have a, uh, a tert butyl group. And, and then we have our oxygen as negatively charged right here. And then our, our cation will be potassium this time. So this is, uh, this is called potassium tert butoxide. So potassium tert butoxide. So the, uh, you, you can see we have a tert butyl group over here, and this would be the conjugate base to tert butanol. So if you protonate tert butoxide, you would get tert butanol. Uh, the abbreviation for this, you might see T-B-U-O-K. So that's, ter that's um, potassium tert butoxide right there. All right, so the, the, these are two of the possible bases. There are more, but the, these are the ones that you would see most commonly. So let's see how these bases affect the regioselectivity of the E2 elimination reaction. So let's look at an E2 elimination reaction here. Let's first write regioselectivity. Or in what region of the molecule will the reaction occur? So let's go ahead and draw out our reactant here. So this will be our alkyl halide. All right, so the regioselectivity of this reaction, we'll worry about talking about specific bases later. Okay, so if we react this alkyl halide with a strong base, what are the possible products? So let's go ahead and first identify our alpha and our beta carbon. The carbon bonded to our halogen is our alpha carbon. And the carbons next door to the alpha carbon are the possible beta carbons. So this is a this is a carbon next to the alpha carbon. So this is a possible beta carbon. I'll call this beta one. Over here, this is also next to the alpha, so I'll call this beta two. And then we have a third possibility right here. I'll call that beta three. Let's go ahead and draw the three products that would result from beta one, beta two, and beta three. So let's go ahead. And, and just draw three arrows here. And then we'll look at the possibility between a beta one. So we'll do the top. The top will be beta one. And then this one will be beta two. And then this one right here will be beta three. All right, so if a strong base comes along and reacts uh, with the proton at the beta one position, the double bond's gonna form between the alpha carbon and the beta one position. So what will the product look like if that happens? So we have our cyclohexane ring here, we have a methyl group, and then the double bond will form between alpha and beta one. So that would be our product. Beta two position, all right? So again, we have our ring here, 
and our methyl group. A double bond will form between our alpha and our beta 2 carbon, like that, so that would be our product. And our third possibility, our third possibility would be the double bond forms between alpha and beta 3, so it would look something like that. All right, let's take a closer look at these products here. Uh, the beta 1 and the beta 2 positions, these are actually the same molecule. If you name that, you would get the exact same name. So there's really only two products in this reaction. And let's analyze those products in terms of stability. So if we look at the uh, product up, up here by, via beta 1 or beta 2, let's, let's see if we can identify it as being mono, di, tri, or tetra substituted. So if I look at this double bond, and I go ahead and put a hydrogen in here, all right, same for this one down here. I think it's a little more obvious that it is tri-substituted, right? So this guy right here is tri-substituted. So tri-substituted. Let's look at the product down here. So what degree of substitution does this alkene have? Well, on this side, there's a hydrogen. On this side, there's a hydrogen. And then we have two alkyl groups on the other side. So this is a di-substituted alkene. So we have a tri-substituted alkene and a di-substituted alkene. We already know that the tri-substituted is the most stable. So usually this is going to be the one that forms in, in major amounts, right? So, so tri-substituted will be the major will be in major amounts, which we call the, the Zaitsev or the Zaitsev product. So this will be the Zaitsev product. And um, if we use sodium ethoxide, this would be the case. So let's go ahead and write sodium ethoxide in here. So if sodium ethoxide were the base used, we would get the majority being the tri-substituted product, the Zaitsev, and the, and the minor product would be the di-substituted one. But it turns out if we use potassium terbutoxide, Right, which we talked about earlier, that's a sterically hindered base. And it turns out for a sterically hindered base, it's easiest for it to show, uh, to, to go for the least substituted alkene. So if I go ahead and draw in, let me go ahead and draw in potassium terbutoxide again so we know what it looks like. All right, if we look at, if we look at potassium terbutoxide, right, with the negative charge there, it's very bulky, right? These, these methyl groups over here make this a very bulky base. It makes it hard to get into certain situations, so there's some steric hindrance here. And so it's actually going to go for, for the beta carbon that's the least sterically hindered, which happens to be beta 3, one of the protons on beta 3. And that will give you your di-substituted alkene as your major product. So if you're using a sterically hindered base, you're actually going to get the less substituted product. So we're actually going to call this the Hoffman product. So the di-substituted product, the di-substituted alkene is called the Hoffman product. And if you used only potassium terbutoxide, you would get your di-substituted as being your major product, and your tri-substituted would, would, would be your minor product. So you have to pick the appropriate base depending on what region of the molecule you want the reaction to occur.